We have moved east to Melbourne and the magnificent Melbourne Cricket Ground. I've got two former England captains alongside me, both experienced playing at this magnificent venue, Owen Morgan and Michael Afton. I mean, it really is truly spectacular, isn't it? It is. When it's full, it's, it's an incredible place to be, as it was the other night for the India-Pakistan game, which I'm sure we'll touch on. It can be a bit eerie when it's not full, and I, I suspect that's what it will be like over the next couple of days for the for the back-to-back -back games that are coming tomorrow and, and Friday. Um, last time I was here, actually, was the, was the Ashes match. That was Scott Boland's game, if yeah. you remember. And I, I don't think I'd ever seen a stadium that was kind of more raucous or wild as Scott Boland was running through England. Um, let's hope on Friday for a different result. When it is full, can it be intimidating as a visiting player? Absolutely. I mean, the, certainly the majority of the times that I've played here have been against Australia and the reception they get and the home support is intimidating to say the least. I can remember the first game in the 2015 World Cup that was the beginning of an absolute <laughs> torture a couple of months for myself and the team but it all started here and everything from the anthems right through until the time that they beat us in the game was is extraordinary. It's a great place to come and play cricket. You grow up you know staying up in the middle of winter staying up to watch Nass win the toss in certain venues or but Melbourne is certainly one of those places you want to come and, and do well. You mentioned that India Pakistan game, over ninety thousand people in. I mean an amazing atmosphere and what an amazing game. It was a fantastic game. That was sold out in a in a heartbeat months ago. You you couldn't get a ticket for, for love nor money. I think I'm right in saying there were more than a thousand applications for the press box, for example. So the interest in that game is extraordinary, obviously because of the rivalry, the historic rivalry, um, uh, you know, the, the, the population levels that both India and Pakistan have got, and also just the rarity value. The, you know, they play each other so infrequently now, only in ICC events because of the political situation there, that it really builds up to, to make it a special uh, occasion. And, and obviously the game itself was such an incredible game, one of the best T20 games I think any of us have seen with just an epic innings from Virat Kohli to top it off. I can't remember a better game of T20 cricket. No. I just can't think of one. Yeah, off the toe, well, I was at dinner while we were watching it with a few of the guys that were there in 2016 when Carlos Brathwaite hit those four sixes. And we were sitting there the last over, India needing 16, <laughs> thinking... They've not got enough here, lads. We've been there. We know what it feels like. But it, it, to watch them play against each other, it's, it's the biggest derby, the biggest rivalry in our sport. So every chance there is for India-Pakistan to play against each other, it is an incredible thing to watch or to be a part of. It's, it's something that Test cricket lacks, to be honest. Um, but when it's played, it's an absolute joy. It, it does make you think, actually, that... You know, thinking about Test cricket, as Morg says there, what a lift it would be for Test cricket and bilateral international cricket if you could find a way for India and Pakistan to play against each other in their own territories. Well, you know, well, it's not yeah. going to happen, um, but fingers crossed that it might happen. You know, sometime in the in the near future, it, it would be a fantastic thing if they started to re-engage at, at a Test match level as well. Not without its controversy, and not without its extraordinary individual performances. I mean, Virat Kohli, the headline act, that first six he hit, straight batting it down the ground. Did you see that coming? Do you think he was going to use the pace? I mean, that was just an extraordinary. I don't think anybody saw it coming. I mean, there are very few things in, in life that you struggle to describe and use words to do so. But it's just genius. It really is. You look at the, the bowler that was bowling, the pace they were bowling at, and, and the level of skill that it takes to play a shot like that, given the context of the game. You know, 17 and over of a game, you need over 13 runs and over. And he is the man to take it down. He's not been at his best for the last 12, 24 months. But my God, it was incredible to see him play in that manner on that sort of stage. You're talking about the, the shot, I think, of Harris Ralph. That's the one you're referring to, which I think was the fifth ball of the 19th over, wasn't it? And Ian Smith, who was on, on commentary, was down pitch side. And he actually said, I think, what the rest of us were thinking, that Ralph had bowled quite short and Pandy you know, couldn't really hit him down the ground as he likes to. And so we all thought, and Ian Smith said, that Coley would 
do what you just said there, which is basically use the pace and try and hit the ball square. So when he hit that straight shot for six down the ground, I, I mean, it was one of the most incredible shots I think any of us have ever seen, uh, you know, in the context of that moment as well. So some slight controversy as well. Was it a no ball on height? How did you think that was handled? And did you know when the ball went down to third man having been bowled <laughs> that it was still a free hit? I thought it was just a no ball. And I, I thought the, 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 the umpiring, that the call was fine. In that last over, I was I was sat watching, thinking, you know what? I'm very glad I'm not on commentary. Here. <laughs> they're, 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 they're the kind of games where you want to be on commentary because it's just an epic occasion and it's building up to a, a fantastic grandstand finish. But there's so much happening in that final over that I just thought, would would I have remembered a that it was a, a free hit because it was two balls before, of course, because it was a wide, and then would I have known that it, it should have been biased? I think when you think about it. It's logical that you would have called, you know, you'd have called the runs at least, uh, because obviously it can't be out. But uh, I thought the lads who, who were on commentary did it well in the end. What is that like when you're in that situation as captain? Because Barbara has come in for some criticism from the Pakistan fans and former players. It's the way it goes with Pakistan don't win any game, but particularly against India. Does it feel like the game is accelerating and you can't think quick enough? Put us out there in that pressure situation that you felt and Barber would have felt the other night. Yeah, well, it's certainly a position that I'd prefer to be in than, than sitting in the stand or sitting in a restaurant watching it on TV. It's, it's way more nerving not being in control of the situation. And certainly in circumstances like that, I've, I've learned to deal with things the hard way. So we go back to the 2016 T20 World Cup final where Ben bowled the last over and things I thought were going relatively slow enough pace. And as a captain, you want to give people as much time to breathe, make good decisions, and then give them the best opportunity to try and execute their skill. When I look back at that final in particular, one of the biggest learnings for me as a captain was that I actually ran over to Ben, threw him the ball, spoke to him, didn't make sure that the conversation was two-way, and then ran off. And the learnings from that for me are now, if I can, I jog at a slow pace, and I try and walk away or hold on to the ball for as long as I can, make sure it's a two-way conversation, make sure there's a clear message to the plan that we're trying to execute, and then hand the ball over. And I think what the, the difficulty Barbara would have had on top of that was there's a spinner bowling. So there's not a lot of time to process things, to execute things. And if you watch the other guys, the Shadab seemed to be involved a hell of a lot. There were other couple of fielders that were, you know, having their two pence at, at, at a stage of the game where actually you probably just want one clear voice speaking to the bowler, making sure he's calm to give him the best chance of executing it. And our mate and colleague DK, the finisher comes out and gets stumped. What was the helmet he's wearing? Something out of some sort of Star Wars. Well, uh, the one person I, you know, who obviously held his nerve and cool in that last Rabbi over Ashen. was Ra Rabbi Ashen. I mean, our friend DK came in and, and made a horlix of, of, of one ball and got kind of carted off. But then... For Ashwin to just leave that ball down the leg mm. side showed a remarkable presence, really. I think most of us would have been having a Swimming merry hard, hack at yeah. it. yeah. Uh, and then, obviously, the last ball, again, he just held his shape and as cool as you like, really. Um, so, yeah, it was fascinating to watch. Well, there, it was, were, there were a on. couple of calls as he was strolling out to bat at the dinner table. I was at for a run out at the non-striker's <laughs> end. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine the controversy. <laughs> that would have just added to a fantastic spectacle. I mean, that has been the highlight of the World Cup so far. But what have you made of it overall so far? There's been some good games, some cracking cricket. Yeah, the, the standard of cricket has been high. Obviously, the first stage of the tournament, before the Super 12s, I think everybody enjoyed the, the general competitiveness of the cricket and the associate nations who, to my mind, are getting better all the time. And the gap between the top and the, and the bottom is, is narrowing. So you're going to see more upsets. And obviously, T20 cricket is a volatile form of the game. Um, and the standard of cricket has been high. I thought New Zealand were very impressive. Mm. I mean, they gave Australia a, a real kicking in that in that game. And, I, you know, they were, were really, I mean, stupid to to not think that New Zealand will turn up in a World Cup because they seem to do ev every time. But I just had the impression watching them over the last 12 months that maybe one or two of their better players were slightly off their peak. But I, they looked eye-catchingly good, I thought, against Australia. Australia themselves, as hosts, now find themselves in a very tricky position. They play late uh, tonight, 10 o'clock tonight, against Sri Lanka. 
and we really have to win that game. And it, it reminds me a little bit going back to the 92 World Cup, the 50 over World Cup here, where Australia came as defending champions. They'd won the World Cup in the subcontinent in 87, but they had a very sticky start. And suddenly, the, as a host, the pressure builds. If you don't get off to a good start, you lose your first game, mm. it becomes very, very difficult. Um, so that'll be interesting to see how they react. I thought England looked impressive, and uh, particularly in the field against Afghanistan at Perth. You know, the catching was, was razor sharp in that game. So, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting so far. Specifically with Australia, they got hammered by New Zealand. You hammered them in the UAE the last time the World T20 was played. They seem to find another gear, though, after you wallop them, and they're going to have to do exactly that here. But is it going to be harder on home soil, as Michael said, with the pressure of a home crowd? Yeah, I think the external pressure can't be underestimated. And I think the Australian public just need a little bit of an excuse to get behind their team. Anything at all, any positive cricket, a small win here or there, they will be back into favourites mode all of a sudden. So you're not completely writing them off given the context of how they won the World Cup last year and where they came from. It's almost like they're the new Pakistan. Just turn up out of form, out of nick, but they'll find a way of doing well. It's, an, it's an, a hell of a skill to be able to do, but it's an, an incredibly tough one. You're, you're, you're dicing with death throughout the whole of a home World Cup, is, which is not what you want to do. And what traditionally successful Australian teams come into the tournament as favourites, look like favourites from start to finish, and they're there or thereabouts right at the end, but not this Australian team. The thing with Australia also, they have to win. They need the points, but they've also got to up their net run rate. So it's almost like every time they go into a game, there's two games at play. Right, lads, we need the points, but we've got to close this gap because the weather around Australia has been iffy, as we saw last night in Hobart, so they're almost under pressure, doubly so, for the net run rate situation. Absolutely, and you, and you throw around the bad weather that's here for the next, say, 10 days. If they have one rained off game, that absolutely cooks them. So they're trying to find form with the bat and the ball and juggle the run rate, which it proved, you know, watching England and Afghanistan, trying chase, England trying to chase down and, and, and get into a, a really strong positive run rate position. It's not as easy as people think. So here, their backs are against the wall, they're a strong enough side with a huge amount of talent. They'll come out all guns blazing come Friday. One, one of the things that might play to their advantage are the conditions. That they play Sri Lanka in Perth tonight, and we were there the other night, of course, and the pitch was very lively. So you'd think that's probably a good place for Australia to play mm. uh, Sri Lanka. We'll see. That may be famous last words. But and again, here at Melbourne, the pitch was quick in that Pakistan-India game. You know, they Mohamed Rizwan was stood about two or three yards inside that inner circle for Harris Ralph, which is exactly where Butler was stood for Wood mm. at Perth. So both pitches flying through, and that should play to Australia's pace attack, which, if, if it's on form, is a, is a serious pace attack. Right, back to the next game here. For us, it's going to be England-Ireland. I mean, fantastic achievement for Ireland getting into the Super 12s. How are they looking ahead of this fixture? Yeah, they look good. They didn't look good against... Sri Lanka three days ago, uh, they, they looked as if there was a little bit of an overlag from the win against the West Indies. Obviously, the high and, and, and you know, achievement of getting through to the final stages haven't been knocked out in the early stages this time last year. But they, they've been in transition for about 12 months. They've had a lot of younger players coming through. So the likes of Wilson, the two O'Briens, William Porterfield aren't around anymore. So they don't have that experience to fall back on. But what they do have is a huge amount of talent mixed with a couple of experienced players, the likes of Paul Sterling and the captain Andrew Balberni at the top of the order. You know, Josh Little's a young left arm quick as well. He's only 22 years old and he's leading their attack. So exposure like tomorrow against England is a huge step in the right direction for Irish cricket. So where are England that then? What do you think they'll do with their side? Um, Chris Wokes may or may not be available given that it's a long flight from Perth and it's quite a short turnaround. And what do you do with Mark Wood? I mean, as he showed the other night, I mean, eye-catching pace, but with accuracy, has become so important to England. Do they sort of roll the dice a little bit and give those two a break and maybe David William, Chris Jordan comes in? But do you underestimate Ireland at your peril? Well, you'd be silly to do that. Ireland are, are dangerous and have got match winners, so, you know, you'd, you'd certainly be silly to underestimate them. You'd like to think that Mark Wood could get through what he needs to get through, which, you know, he's had a couple of days off after the Perth game, play Ireland, day off, 
play Australia. It's eight overs. I know I'm sounding like an old fuddy-duddy, but that you'd like to think that he'd be able to get through that, even though he's throwing himself uh, into it and bowled every ball at over 140 uh, kilometres an hour the other night. Um, but that that's down to, to him and the medics. He'll he'll you know tell them how he's feeling, and they certainly won't take any risks with him because he is the one that they'll have their fingers crossed. They can probably cover most other bases. The two bowlers that they can't cover are Adil Rashid and Mark Wood because they offer them something that nobody else does. So they'll be very much fingers crossed where they're concerned. I'm sure you'd have a conversation with the guys and the medical staff, but as a gut feel, what do you think you would do in this sort of situation? Yeah, I, I think Ath nailed it. I think you need to speak to the player. Mark Wood knows his body better than anybody else. And if there's an ounce of doubt, you, you leave him out. He plays two of Key, too much of a key role in this campaign to be playing around with his levels of fitness because the, the tournament is short and sharp any sort of niggle will rule him out for the whole lot of it so it's not a bad thing if they did bring in the likes of Chris Jordan he's coming back from a finger injury he's only played one game since the hundred in August so to get him a game under his belt wouldn't be a bad thing I agree with you I'm not sure if Chris Wokes will play either so it, it might be David Willey who comes in as well. But, you know, we're at Melbourne. It's a different challenge for England. It, a huge opportunity for Adil Rashid to get himself into the tournament. It's a great place to bowl spin, um, albeit the time of the year and, and the grass on the wicket. It's still a really good place Absolutely. to bowl spin. Absolutely. Um, so I see England going with the same lineup. If they did make the changes, they still have the likes of Stokes, Ali, mm. Livingston to cover overs if, if need be. How impressed have you been with Sam Curran? Well, he, he's becoming indispensable, isn't he? Which you wouldn't have said probably, I don't know, six months ago. You, you're probably looking at that number eight place, death bowling um, place, going to somebody like Chris Jordan, who did pretty well in the summer. But the way Sam Curran has played recently in, in Pakistan and then in the warm-up games to this tournament, it's very hard to leave out. He's got a lot of variety there. He gives you a lot of options. And where he's particularly growing in confidence is that position bowling at, at the end where you know surprise bouncer cutters he's got ability to bowl a Yorker he seems to have a knack of, of picking up wickets five wickets in that Afghanistan game so hard to leave out um, you know he will be tested more against some other teams than he was uh, against Afghanistan and of course no matter who you are at some stage you're going to go around the park mm. bowling at the death yeah. yeah exactly so I think the key thing for somebody who does that role is kind of your mentality. And he seems, A, he's a very competitive cricketer and he seems to be up for the challenge. And you have to be a fairly phlegmatic soul and, and recognise that just occasionally you're going to go around the park yourself. Just one thing with the batting, is it worth keeping an eye on the strike rate of Alex Hales at the top of the order? Because in the games against Australia, he sort of had a runner ball or just under the start. And then obviously we know his ability to catch up. But with that start, can that put more pressure on Joss Butler and Joss might be thinking right we need, really need to go here I've got to take that extra little risk. Yeah absolutely I think when you're playing against England you look at where you can potentially lose the game and which players can potentially take the game away from you and Joss Butler is by far and away England's main batter and has the ability against any team in this tournament to win the game in the space of five or six overs. What you don't want from your partner no matter who it is if it's an opener or a number three is adding pressure to that player and making him feel like he needs to do something extraordinary every game. He should be able to ease, ease himself into the game and then go through the gears and play the, play the game as he sees it. I think Alex is in a similar enough position to David was, say, two years ago when people said, oh, he's a slow starter. We know Alex can sometimes take his time to get going, but I think just be conscious of it. it, it, is, it is a partnership. It's not a, I'm going to get runs over the course of 20 overs type of a game. That type of England doesn't play for England anymore. So 120 balls, England bad until 10. How many runs can he get? How would Josh be feeling though, getting the campaign off to a start? There's all the hype, all the build up, the problems that they've had in the summer. The momentum seems to be going that way, but you've still got to win that first game as captain in the World Cup. He got it done. Is that a big, <sighs> right, we're off now? Yeah, I think it is. And I think it's a bit of a relief for everybody involved within the squad, everybody from the coaching staff right down to the guys that are, that are carrying the drinks. To get yourself away and into a tournament, not only gives you reassurance, well, with a win, not only gives you reassurance that what you're doing is positive and right, and you pat yourself on the back because you're going in the right direction, but also gives you an opportunity to reiterate the direction you're going and how long it will take to get there. 
and to stick with the process and not to grab things before they're there in front of you. So I think the whole camp will be delighted, although this week is a really big week for them. It certainly is. So England play Ireland on Wednesday here at the Melbourne Creek Ground. It's not going to be full by any means, but on Friday when they take on Australia, it is a sellout. And I walked through and had a look at our mate Warney's statue, and you've got the Shane Warne stand over yeah. there. He'd be loving that game on Friday night. A packed MCG, oh, his would. beloved he'd, MCG, England, Australia. He'd love it if he was in the commentary box. Of course, it would be in his absolute element were he uh, were he playing in a game like that. Those were the, those are the games that he absolutely loved. But you're right, that new stand has been named. Not new stand, but the stand has been named. It's a new one in his in his honour. Since we were last here, there's the statue just outside yeah. there. Um, has it still got a kind of bag of chips and a no, pork pie got, on it, which it did a, have, a very, and a can of beer last time? It's I got was a very there. wilted thing of flowers that someone has generously left, but they've seen better days. Anyway, we will see you on Wednesday.